So I think we'll get going at that. So welcome everybody again to another virtual edition of Entrepreneurs Club. I hope you're all keeping safe and well and uh, avoiding this uh, coronavirus. Um, today, if you've been to any of these meetings before, it's going to take a very similar format. Usually we'd be meeting in the old hall face to face, eating sandwiches together and uh, not social distancing and things like that, but obviously that's well out of the window at the moment. Um, so today we've uh, we've taken our, our uh, Entrepreneurs Club online again. So this is the, maybe the fourth or fifth session that we're doing online. Um, Victoria and John and I got together really early on when this uh, crisis hit and we just sort of had a bit of a, a chat about, we were all getting very repeat conversations happening in our practice and there's quite a lot of overlap between our practices. So we said actually it'd be a really good opportunity to put this online and do a formal Q&A with everybody. Now throughout this last sort of couple of weeks we've been uh, individually sent questions by clients and on social media and all types, all types of things like that. If you have tuned into any of our previous sessions and um, we should have renamed them the furlough session because we've had a lot of questions about furlough. Um, however, at the last couple of sessions we've noticed there's been a little bit of a, a subtle shift towards maybe questions now about the reopening of the economy, how to bring people back into uh, the workplace uh, and so on and so forth. So um, we'll proceed with that format today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. I'm sure everybody's aware of how uh, Zoom works by now, um, but just in case you're not, there are some buttons, depending on what type of device you're on, either at the bottom or the top of the screen, um, which will give you a few options. So the chat button, um, if, we, if you want to talk to each other or just sort of put general comments in there, feel free to chat away. Um, the Q&A button is specifically if you have a question about your own business or there's a point of discussion that you've been having over the last few weeks and you'd like us to talk about it today, then just pop it on the Q&A and then it'll give us a chance to go through those and answer them towards the end. Um, we'll try and record the session and afterwards we'll send you an email, try and get this recording out. Um, and also there is a now a official Liverpool Entrepreneur Club uh, group page on LinkedIn. So if you'd like to be part of that, just send me a quick email. Uh, I'll be emailing you afterwards and we'll make sure that you sign up to that. Um, I'm the lucky one that gets to host again today. So um, I will uh, go through our questions um, now. Now we've got about an hour. We're going to aim to finish this by about half past four as usual. We'll try and keep you on time. So. Where else to start? I'm not going to start with furlough, even though it's the top questions that I've got. I'm going to move on to sort of the return to work, be a bit more positive. So first and foremost, um, Victoria, if I can pose the question to you, sorry to get you there on the hop, but um, the question that's come in, and this is actually somebody that one, one of my clients that asked me this, and it was sort of what they're finding at the moment is there's a real boggle of different information on what health and safety things and what things they need to do in terms of preparing the office and preparing the staff for return to work. They're very much sort of looking imminently at bringing people back to the office on a scaled back uh, basis. So what kind of hints and tips have you got in terms of keeping, um, keeping that side going? Okay, so um, give you, I mean, it's great actually to provide you with some insight on what we're doing as well. So we opened up our offices this week um, only our Liverpool office and the idea being that it became a base for people um, we, we did it voluntary just said to people look you know if you want to come in we'll do the risk assessments we'll make it safe uh, but if there is it gave us the ability to bring in some of our new starters because we were having a challenge trying to get them um, inducted virtually was, was really difficult for us given the nature of what we do uh, and everybody within our business sort of put their hands up and said, yeah, I would really love the opportunity for just one day a week even just to be able to go into the office. So, so what we've done is we ran a thorough risk assessment before and you have to do that. Um, you have to follow the sort of the template for a risk assessment. It's specific to COVID. It's important if you are in a shared building that you also get the... Um, the risk assessment from your landlord so that was something that we we asked for um our landlord wasn't that forthcoming at first and hadn't done a great job so we forced their hand really to say well we need this you know we are liable for our our, our um our staff so we need this information when you've completed the risk assessment the risk assessment will ask you various things about social distancing for example 
ask you about the need maybe for PPE equipment and you'll fill it out and, and identify the risk. That information then needs to be put on your website. It needs to be visible for all of your staff, but it also needs to be visible to your clients. Um, to, so that's an important thing to note as well, that it does go up and it's very open and transparent. Um, we did things, say for example, from a social perspective, like we um, asked, we moved, not necessarily removed the desk, but we've put sort of notices on certain desks that can't be used at the moment. So we've got um, some of them are blocked off so that people work diagonally rather than one sort of to one another or, or opposite. Uh, obviously, sort of lots of signage, lots of um, hand sanitizer, cleaning equipment as you, as you would expect. Um, PP equipment for the communal areas as well. And uh, for, what, for what we do, and I'm sure lots of people are on the call as well, if you're going out to clients, you know, we had some of our, we have clients, uh, you know, in, in construction that have gone back and they require us to go on site now. So again, we just need to make sure that we provide the PP equipment to our team for when they're going out on, on site. Uh, and then it's just, it, it's interesting really, my, my advice would definitely be, because I, I was quite heavily involved in our risk assessment is for you to physically go into your offices and think about various scenarios. So, you know, like, we had to remove the, no, nobody was allowed to use the boardroom facilities. So it's a little bit odd because you could actually be in the office and you'll still be on a Zoom, but sort of in various offices, and, you know, together, but you can't, you know, sit sort of near each other. You've got to have that two metre distance. Uh, we, we took away sort of tea and coffee. You know, you can't make each other tea and coffee. You've got to bring in your own you bring in your own water, bring in your own food, you're responsible for yourself, which quite a lot of the team quite enjoy actually, because no one has to do any tea and coffee rounds anymore. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing that we've done is obviously sort of a rotation. So, and this will very much depend on your, your building and your setup. We can only have only five people in the office at any one time. It's the only way that we can physically sort of manage the two meter rule and also we had to consider the sort of kitchen facilities. It would have been impossible to only allow, because we're only allowing one person in the kitchen at any one time. So that, the, the, there's quite a lot to consider really um, within the practicalities. You also need to do an induction. So you need to re-induct your staff when they go back into to the, your offices or wherever it is that you work and ensure that they are really comfortable. Cause that, that's a big concern of mine. I think if people aren't educated and understand what they need to do, because the, the message by the government, you know, is a little bit confusing. Uh, you would, I would hate for sort of employees to breach the sort of health and safety rules without them realizing that they had done. So that's very important. And also sort of like a declaration form for them to complete. Cause again, you've got to assure that they've got no symptoms right now, that they're not in one of the sort of risk categories. And sometimes what I found with clients is they make the assumption that they're not in a risk category but they don't necessarily know they don't know who they live with they don't know if they've got an underlying condition that maybe they've never declared before so this um this this sort of like document and, and, and declaration form will cover those areas so that you are aware of any any risks that you maybe didn't know before but i, I do have a, um, a 20 step a process that if they're not a client on uh, the call now i'm more than happy to share with people just to help them just to give them that guidance on what they need to do to be able to uh, get themselves back into work. Well, that maybe actually points to a question that Sean's just asked, which is uh, where would we find the risk assessment and guidelines? Do you know if, the, if, if that's what you're referring to there, if there's an official set that we should be abiding to? Yeah, there is. Sean, I think, I think you've actually, um, I could, oh, sorry, sorry, Sean, I thought it was the other Sean. I was going to say, Sean, I think you've got it already, but uh, it's Sean O'Neill. Uh, yeah, there is some, there is guidance on, so the government, um, you have got it sort of on their website, the HMRC, it is there, um, but I can send you this 20 page step and it does refer to it for you, so I'll send it across and, and hopefully that'll be able to help you. Great, I was just typing that, so I'll come back to that in a second. And um, just to buy me a bit of time while I'm doing that, um, John, if I can switch over to you at this point. So question that we've had come in here, um, what support will there be beyond many uh, for the self-employed? Okay. Um, 
that is one for me, I guess. Um, yeah, so the self-employed um, have had a, a scheme called the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme, which provided a grant to the self-employed. I think there was a bit of confusion at first over the definition of self-employed in that that term gets used in, in a lot of areas and you know, whether it's applying for a mortgage or, or other things but for the purposes of the grant the self-employed are people who fill in the self-employed section of a personal tax return each year um, so it doesn't include limited company directors as an example to date the there was a grant pay or payable in kind of may which covered three months of profits um based on and, and basically the calculation was they took the last three tax returns the year ending 5th april 17 5th april 18 and 5th april 19 worked out an average monthly profit during that period um if you hadn't worked the whole period they just prorated it and paid over 80 percent of the monthly profit for three months so in to make it simple for me if your average monthly profit was a thousand pounds you got 800 pounds times three two thousand four hundred pounds and the maximum grant was seven thousand five hundred in total and you could claim that um last month basically was there in may it was extended um about two weeks ago now when the chancellor announced the extension of the furlough scheme at the same time um basically extended this scheme as well um, it's now been extended for another three months so they will now use exactly the same calculation to work out monthly profits and they're going to cover basically june july and august payable in august but the percentage will actually drop to 70 percent so in my example if your average monthly profits were a thousand pounds you'll get 700 pounds times three which is £2,100. Now that's payable in one lump sum in August. Um, for anybody who hasn't claimed the last one yet, because you do actually have to go on and claim it because basically they don't have your bank details otherwise, you've got until the 13th of July to do so. Um, the specifics over the claim for next time are actually being published this Friday, actually the 12th of June. Um, but it's a reasonable assumption it'll be exactly the same as last time where to an extent you went on and logged on provided bank details ticked um you self-declared that you had been impacted by covid19 um the size of the impact was irrelevant it's just you've been impacted and based on that you got the money within it's about six working days it was it's actually pretty quick so that's kind of where we are um what they're not doing, which I've been asked a few times actually, um, I don't know if it's possible in the question today, but I've been asked a few times, is they're not extending it basically to anyone who didn't get one last time. Um, so one of the problems with the last one for some people was unless you've done a tax return for the 5th of April 19 or before, you're not eligible, which means if you set up your business on the 6th of April 2019, which is you know, a year ago now, you couldn't get anything. That's still the same for, for this one. Um, it, it can be exactly the same people, just they can get another grant. If you didn't apply for a grant last time, you can actually apply for this one um, because you did have to self certify that you were impacted by COVID. So, if for whatever reason you weren't at that point, but you are now, you can get the second grant. Um, so, it, overall, it's quite a generous scheme so the course of six months they're paying on average 75 percent of the monthly profits out um obviously it's not quite as much as the 80 percent furlough staff but in the grand scheme of things it is quite quite a you know, quite quite a decent grant and, and obviously well worth well worth getting so we've actually had a couple of bolts on questions then i was thinking to myself when, when you were answering that there as far as the discretionary grant goes um what does eligibility look like? So what type of businesses are eligible and what, what kind of reasons might have you missed out on the first one? How would you know if you qualify for the next one? Is there, is there any kind of guidance you can give on that? Yeah, so there two, it's, it's the, the separate grants, actually. So the self-employment grants, was, sorry, that one. Yeah. The discretionary grants is a different grant. Oh, right, is, sorry. Um, as an, an entirely different grant, actually, um, which I'm happy to talk about now or, or, or later, Alex, if you are... <laughs> Um, I just have a question, John. Just yeah, just on the the, um, the self employed, is it still the same in terms of they can still work? So obviously, with yeah. fellow, you were unable to to work while self 
employees you could still work and, and, and get take the money yeah yes and, and that was a big difference between furlough or furlough to date as furlough has been all or nothing um i.e you can't work at all whereas the self-employed you could be working and just had to be impacted and the the size of the impact was immaterial so if you'd i mean if you'd lost one sale for a tenner you could quite you know honestly tick the box you'd be impacted so you know, that that was actually a big disparity between the two schemes um to date and, and, and it, for the self-employed it, it continues exactly the same whereas obviously furlough was i'm sure will crop up during the call um it is now introducing the part-time furlough That's interesting. I, d I didn't know the difference between the two, to be honest. When I just when I'm reading the questions here and I saw grants, I just thought that that was the same thing. So two completely separate things. Um, yeah, the discretionary grants are totally different, and, and perhaps we'll come back to that. So I don't hog the first half hour, <laughs> which, which I would do if I went on to that one as well. Okay. Well, I'll um, I'll take a question that I've been sent actually. So let me just have a read here. So. Uh, the market seems to have come back quite strongly in the US. Why is the UK market lagging behind? Um, I assume the person there is talking around um, general sort of indexes. Um, it could be a number of reasons, really. I mean, sterling as a whole hasn't been doing great over the past few months. Um, that's definitely held us back. Um, I think also if you actually were to look at the major indexes, so let's say take the FTSE 100 and then take the... Um, the Dow or even more extreme, the NASDAQ over in the US. And for those that aren't aware, essentially the, the US uh, stock market uh, content is much more um, tech laden um, than, than ours is. So if you were to look at our, our FTSE 100, um, it's heavily, um, well, it was airline stocks, but there's been quite controversial this last couple of weeks because there's a couple of airlines dropped out um, due to what's been going on. But it's it's usually heavily sort of banks, energy stocks, uh, that type of thing, of which they haven't been doing too well, they haven't been too great, and then obviously the, the sterling effects have, uh, have compounded that effect. Um, but over in the US, you have um, the world-renowned FANG stocks over there, so um, you know, you Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, Netflix, Google, and then obviously Microsoft as well. I saw a um, ridiculous couple of stats the last couple of weeks about Microsoft, for one, where Microsoft now, if you were to take their market cap size, you could hold that pretty much in, in line with the FTSE 100 and that one company has the same market cap as our whole top 100 companies in the UK at the moment. Um, and the other one being that Zoom, the very software that we're using. I mean, I, I, I didn't know really that much about Zoom when it was February this year, um, but there was a, a great graphic presented the other day, which is now Zoom is more valuable, uh, technically valuable, the nine, the nine uh, largest airlines over in the US combined. Um, so it just shows you the, perhaps the defensive call has been to move into tech, move into streaming services, and you've seen the capital value rise over in the US. Um, whereas in the UK, we've got more of a, maybe long-standing traditional market impacted by sterling, which is um, perhaps suppressed it for a little bit longer. That would be my take on it. Now, quite interesting, the last couple of weeks has been people looking at the horizon, looking forward at, at what comes next. And this sort of idea that our, perhaps our marketplace will move towards maybe a, a greener economy or maybe moving towards more healthcare with AstraZeneca and everything going on with vaccines at the moment. It, it could be quite an exciting change for the, for the UK market, but it does depend largely on how quickly we can pivot, how quickly we can take advantage of any government finance that's in place and try and drive that sector forward, because ultimately that's what happens a lot over in the US. Um, so um, ultimately a number of different reasons, but um, I mean, for example, the US NASDAQ uh, is heavily tech laden, and I think they're actually showing a positive for this year now. So then they've come straight back through uh, a 40, 30, 40% loss and then back into positive again which is staggering. I saw that they moved up yesterday, moved on again today. Um, so if we now move to the ever popular conversation, furlough, we've all been waiting for it, so we might as well crack on with it. Um, for, that, for those that have joined for the first time, it's a bit of a running joke, because essentially we've had about 700 questions on furlough, about four questions on other things over the past five weeks. So, um, 
Right, so quite an interesting one here, a bit of a different uh, tact. Um, somebody's asked a question, can I continue to furlough my staff if my business does not pick back up? So what's your thoughts, guys? Well, I've unmuted myself already. As soon as you said furlough, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, 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 today actually has worked out a really, a really good day for this to be on because just to remind people that if you haven't furloughed anyone, you need to furlough them by today because ultimately the, new, the current scheme will close at the end of this month. So if you have, and then the, we've got this new introduction of the furlough scheme, but the flexible furlough, so what um, John alluded to before, um, and it will close all, it at the, it'll close in October completely. But what the government has said is that if you haven't got somebody furloughed by the end of this month, then they will not be allowed to go onto the flexible furlough scheme. Now, I think that has caused some confusion and clients that are on the call now of mine will know that we sent something out this week just to remind people in sort of uh, big bold letters that they must, because you have to have been furloughed for three weeks, you need to work backwards from the end of this month. So the date is the today. So if you haven't furloughed anybody and you do intend to, then I really would urge you to, to, to get that done. Um, because otherwise you cannot now bring anybody, you cannot put, you can't sort of bring somebody into furlough at a later date that hasn't already been furloughed. Because that is actually a follow up question that we have, which is, and I think you've answered it there, is do my staff need to be furloughed on the 30th of June to be furloughed part time afterwards? So you're essentially saying yes, but it needs to happen today. Yeah, yeah. And the deadline is today, so people could still furlough today and it'd still come into effect. Yeah, as long as they can demonstrate that they have furloughed that person for three weeks so it's got to be done by today so anybody that you want to be able to take advantage of that furlough scheme then i really would urge you to do it now you can't do it at a later date okay victoria actually sorry because actually I, I i know where that little add on question came from and i actually i'll i'll, I'll perhaps just re re repeat it actually because it was actually it was a slight tweak on it actually was we were asked by somebody, um, the question was actually, do they have to be furloughed actually on the 30th of June? If you see what I mean, i.e. So not from now could, to the 30th could, could, they have been, could they have been furloughed previously, be back on the 30th of June, can they be re-furloughed later? Is actually the question. Sorry, John, I, I lost you then. Completely. Oh, so, 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 sorry, because I know the person who asked the question, I know actually what they're asking and it was a discussion we'd have. It, it, the the, the, the follow-on question was actually, does somebody have to actually be furloughed on the 30th of June itself on that very date to ever be furloughed again? I could oh, they right, have been okay. furloughed previously, come back and go off later? Right, I see. Yeah. Um, so they need to be furloughed on, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but my understanding is that they need to be furloughed on the 30th of June, which is why we're sort of saying to people that they have to be, they have to have done it by now. So it's, it's more to, I suppose, what the government are trying to do now is they're trying to um, obviously ease the lockdown and encourage people to, to get back into work and, and slowly but surely trying to ease us off furlough. So... I think the the argument by the government is that if people aren't furloughed at that point in time then they don't really need to be furloughed after that now so again you know if, if you have had somebody on i know we've advised on, on previous sessions about alternating every three weeks mm, you need yeah yeah that, that that that's what why the client was that my is my client was chatting to me yesterday about it and i thought i'd i dropped in today the, who have 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 um rotated slightly because it's slightly project based what they do um there's been a follow-up question actually from paula thanks paula so it says here if you bring back a member of staff part-time in july can you then put them back on furlough later month or do they have to stay part-time slash work furlough right okay so this um, this links to the new flexible 
furlough. So, so Paula, what you can do is you can do both from July, which is something that we have banged the drum about throughout, which should have always been the case really to give that flexibility. So what you can do from July is you can actually bring somebody back part time. The days that they work part time, you so say, say, for example, they work for you two days, you bring them back, then you pay them at the full rate for those two days. And if they say do five days a week, then the remaining three days you will pay them. They would be furloughed, and you know if if, you, if that's at eighty percent or hundred percent, depending on on how you pay currently, then that would be what your claim would be. So it it does. So you won't have to sort of keep rotating or bring them back and and furloughing and not furloughing. You can keep them on furlough, but you can bring them back to your business as well. So it is a really good positive move and something that long awaited really interesting okay um if we can just temporarily i know we're all sort of pent up by furlough here so we can just temporarily move off it that'd be good come back to it i promise um, no, Alex. i know <laughs> there's a general gasp of the room we got it we got it um all right well an interesting question here john and i were discussing this just before we actually went uh, live today so um, the question was more of a statement, really, and it was a, a client whose accountant has gone missing over the past 10 weeks, not literally, um, but they've, uh, they've been engaged with other clients and they've struggled to get hold of their accountant. Um, how hard is it to transfer accountants at the moment, John? Well, funny, I, I, I had to check with Alex, it's all wasn't my client's <laughs> asking. <laughs> So it, it, it should be the same as normal and, and again I probably don't want to it's a valid question but one I don't want to have to spend too much time on this call for because it's not about coronavirus and what have you but to an extent it's, it's the same as usual in that it's um, if somebody is moving accountant it's an admin process it shouldn't be too difficult other than a bit of admin the two accountants liaise to get all information across and what have you um, I think I mean, what, what, I, what I would say is at least trying to have a chat with the accountant and just see what's going on, whether there's something kind of temporary that, 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 that has got in the way of the service or something you can rectify first before, before moving. But if somebody is to move, yes, it's a case of find another accountant and, and, um, and start that process. And it's, it's a bit like obviously it'd be like changing banks where the banks talk to each other and transfer the direct debit, same with accountant, accountants ethically by our institutes will talk to each other move the information across and there'll just be a kind of bit of admin for the clients um to kind of obviously sign engagement ID and what have you and i should point out it wasn't me or one of john's clients that said that so that's good <laughs> <laughs> Not if, if, if it was i'd say it's very hard to move <laughs> almost impossible um gavin's asked a question here live um what extra concerns and liabilities with your staff should company owners, uh, directors be aware of? So mainly, should you keep a record of your staff's understanding of your back to work policy and new workplace guide, uh, guidelines? And how often should you review their understanding of these guidelines? So ongoing record keeping, what's your, what's your thoughts on that, Victoria? Okay, well, I'd recommend, Gavin, that you absolutely make sure that you get either a signature or you know an email sort of confirmation from your team to say that they are have looked at the, the risk assessment and they've also read the sort of guidance so i sent out the risk assessment to all of my team i also then produced like a new induction pack and the induction it said sort of like what they needed to be aware of what sort of changes we had um, and they had to sign that at the end uh, now I understand given us working remotely for them to just email back to say yeah you know I and I've loaded on HR and I'll keep those, those records and I think from from your perspective and I understand as, as an employer as well it's it's that nervousness of sort of if if, if any hundred percent I think in, in the most important thing for all of us with our staff, we want to look after them. So um, I would also suggest that obviously you're going to re-induct everyone, so not just new starters with these, these changes to health and safety. Um, 
there will be changes and, and things will change over time as well you know there's already talks of sort of maybe changing the social distancing rules from two meters to one so my advice would probably be as those changes happen with the government that will give you the opportunity to just be inducted as it were and just get that that assurance that your staff understand and a couple of people have asked me this question quite a few times in terms of what do you do if people don't take the rules as they were sort of seriously and um, so ultimately it's very important to make sure that you feel you look in the mirror and think you know I've done everything I possibly can to um, induct and, and sort of educate the team so they know what we're doing but if somebody does continue to, to you know breach those health and safety procedures then you know you, you will have to invoke your disciplinary process and, and again that's something that I've had to remind my team of that, that, that these rules are here to protect them and, and it's very important that people don't as we've seen in the parks of what people have done so far some people are not taking this as seriously as others. Yep I'd completely agree with that I think um hope that answers that um Moving on slightly to different tacts, so move on to bounce back loans, um, which have been uh, really popular. Um, so John, if I can ask you, there's a couple of questions here almost linked together. So um, it says here that, well, it's actually diametrically opposed. It says, I've a bounce back loan, but now need more. Can I get C bills? Um, but then also linked to that, somebody has got bounce back. They don't need the cash right now. Um, but should I borrow more against bounce back just in case? So it's kind of what can someone do if they've got bounce back as far as extra lending and, and what would you be recommending recommending in terms of taking the maximum out? Well, I guess with with with, with the bounce back loan, the the maximum you can borrow is fifty thousand pounds or twenty five percent of turnover is a smaller of the two. So if your annual turnover is hundred thousand pounds, the motion has twenty five thousand pounds and up to if your or turn over two hundred thousand pounds or more. Um, you can have fifty thousand. C bills start at fifty thousand and one pound um, and, and, and upwards. So in terms of the bounce back loans, I mean the, the schemes could go to the fourth of November. So if somebody hasn't borrowed yet um, and is thinking, oh, do I need it or not? They don't have to make it yet. You've got until fourth of November. So it's you know an amount of time to pause and think about it. If you've already got a bounce back loan, um, and this actually works the other way as well, actually, if you'd already got a C bills loan before bounce back had been um, announced, you could transfer it from a C bills to a bounce back as long as it was for the loan 50,000. If you have a bounce back loan and you want to borrow more, you can get a C bills loan. Um, but you would have to use part of that to pay back the bounce back because after once once you've finished with the arrangement, you can't have both. You can have one or the other. Um, so yes, if you borrowed fifty thousand pounds and a bounce back and, and realised, oh, actually, I need, I oh, actually needed a hundred thousand pounds, you could apply for a C bills loan of a hundred thousand and repay the bounce back you already had. At the end, let's say at the end of the process, you, you, you can only have one or the other. Um, now, actually. Um, Funding circle actually kind of making a bit of a thing of that at the moment about um, now they've got C bills loans um, about actually doing that and potentially if you want to get more is therefore borrow borrow that pay back the bounce back and just move on to C bills with a, a, a larger amount. So just thinking aloud here, so say somebody applied for bounce back, we know that they could get maybe twenty thousand pounds or something like that, but they decide to only take ten or eleven because that's all they feel that they need. Um, would you be saying actually you should be sort of taking the 20 because you've got 12 months without paying any interest and then decide what you need and pay back the difference or would it be better to take the 11 and then maybe extend in future if you can do that? It is a common thing of quite a lot of a lot of people I know either as clients or, or, or more, more widely have taken the bounce back loan whether they need it or not because yeah there's no interest and no charges for a year and to an extent that's taking it almost as a buffer um, and, and putting it to one side and if they do need to you know and if it turns out they don't need it repaying it next year um, at the moment you I don't think any of the banks right now but I mean additional lenders are being added and simply the banks are updating as they go at the moment I'm not aware that if you borrow half the amount of your bounce back loan you can go back and ask for 
a bit more, I would assume you will be allowed to at some point before the 4th of November. I think to an extent with the banks, it's been, been so overwhelmed with mm. these applications for C bills and bounce back loans, they've had to keep it quite simple. Um, one of the issues actually is, and, and I talked to someone yesterday who um, banks with a bank that doesn't yet offer the bounce back loan, um, and therefore can it go somewhere else? And at the moment, um, again, funding circle are waiting for accreditation, but at the moment, the only lender who offers a bounce back loan to non-customers is HSBC, um, but they've got a huge, huge, huge waiting list at the moment. Um, so, you know, you are kind of way back there in terms of getting it because all of the banks are basically kind of overwhelmed with applications to their own customers. Okay, um, thank you. Um, if I go on to a question that I uh, was asked this week and I thought it'd be useful to um, derive the differences. So there is a term within investing. So if you are managing uh, pension funds or you've got staff that have got pension funds, um, quite understandably over the past eight or nine weeks, there's been quite a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uh, emotions around that sort of thing. And the questions that, that I'm getting quite a lot are, it's sort of around the type of funds available, so very much in that product layer of the ecosystem. Um, one of the questions that came in was, uh, I've been told by my pension um, that I'm in a passively managed fund. I've got no idea what this means. What is this and what is the alternative? So just really simply, uh, a passively managed fund is, is usually some form of a tracker. So um, what it will do is it will try and aim to replicate the performance of a particular index or indices. So could be you know a FTSE tracker it could be a, an MSCI tracker it could be a number of different things um, ultimately what it will do though is it will try and expose the investor um, within a certain sort of parameter to whatever those returns have been now perhaps why I've had a number of these questions over the past eight to nine weeks is um, with markets being so volatile it's created quite a lot of uncertainty around uh, in people's minds when they're in a tracker because um, the market obviously takes quite a significant tumble, then might go through a period of recovery, and that um, that wave of emotion, the client is really closely tied to it. Um, so whatever it does, you, your fund will probably do very similar. Um, the other alternative is is moving towards more of an actively managed fund, and an actively managed fund is there's actual stock picking going on, and there might be bond picking going on. So a diversified portfolio, not really driven to the same tailored performance of a, of a particular index. And with that type of thing, um, why that maybe that question came up, it's from a conversation I had earlier this week, was um, it's managing the downside, really. So I think that whenever a, a market blip or a trough or a period of volatility uh, comes along, if you're in an actively managed fund, in theory, as long as it's, it's matched up in a number of different ways to, to what you think feel uh, is appropriate your fund manager has got more uh, scope to manage the downside so to pick defensive stocks for example to move more money to cash because they don't have to be within a certain uh, sort of certain bandwidth of, of an index anymore and um, so it, it can offer reassurance um, but saying that as well there are some very good trackers out there ultimately deciding on, on what's right for you or ultimately your staff because I know there's a lot of business owners on here um, information and, and data in this period are, are very important, but more of a translation of that information and data is, is what's more important. So getting someone to speak to staff, getting someone to um, talk to individuals about their funds is, is really important. Um, moving back up now towards um, furlough, if we, can, if we can spend a couple of minutes on furlough. Um, so there's one here. Which is saying, my business is okay now, but will have a drop in a couple of months as the customers drop away. How do I furlough staff? So who wants to take that one, guys? Do you want to go through the or should I start? I think the... <laughs> you're muted anyway. <laughs> so I will start. So, so, so the... They're okay now, but want to furlough later, I think was the question. I think the, the, the issue with that will be that this 30th of June deadline. So if somebody hasn't been furloughed before the 30th of June, you can't 
furlough them later. Um, the you know the, the, the flexible furloughing is is really good is really positive positive, allowing kind of part time furloughing in the future. But it, but I guess one of the things it doesn't pick up are yeah businesses where the drop off in their work is not immediate. So they might be I don't know doing project work or something, and projects are now coming to an end, and then there's no future work so unfortunately unless a staff member has been furloughed for three weeks before the 30th of june it can't be furloughed later it is kind of a, a black or white the other thing actually linked to that as well is that um from the 1st of july onwards the maximum amount of people you can have furloughed in any given pay period is capped at the most you claim for in any pay in a period before the 30th of june as well so it, it just come at two angles because they're trying to get people back to work and there will be some businesses because the nature of the business it unfortunately doesn't help if that drop-off wasn't immediate and the drop-off comes in you know july or august as say projects work or something like that fair enough and the, the question that we've had live uh, anonymously live um is uh should accountants be charging an extra fee for processing a furlough claim Mm -hmm. um should it, it it depends um i am i'm a fun type of guy and spend some time in groups of accountants um kind of online in terms of kind of whatsapp and facebook groups the accountants all around the country it's probably split 50 50 um over those who are charging and those aren't um we haven't charged anything to anyone yet I took a view, certainly for the first month, and that's been two, two, two months this, I, I, I felt we wanted to support the clients right now. Having said that, in month one, in terms of hours spent, we had two people on it, and between them, it's 40 odd hours. They spend process furlough claims for no fee. So some of my peers think, therefore, I was stupid to do so, because it's 40 odd hours for, for nothing. So there isn't actually a right or a wrong answer. I think what I did actually, we, we had about 200 clients we process 130 payrolls there. There are about two thirds from have a payroll, I'm gonna say. I think we, we had one complaint about the furlough and, and it was simply that, why haven't you processed mine yet? And we had, so we have to prioritize to an extent and, and you know, some of our clients are furloughed. I think the most is for about 70 staff. Um, this is somebody who's furloughed one. Um, we just had to say, look, we've got to try and do it in, in a certain order. So I sent an email to all of our clients to say, um, and I'm trying to think of the wording I use, it was along the, along the lines I said, we're not, a, we're not asking for a fee, we're asking for patience and understanding, I think was what I put. I'm just saying, look, we're, 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 we're trying to help here. I'm not asking you to pay us, but just please understand it's actually taking quite a lot of time. And just therefore to, to, to be patient as we work our way through them. But I said it's not there's not a right or a wrong answer on whether an accountant should or shouldn't charge because it is an additional service. It just comes down to you and your relation with your accountant. Fair enough. Um, there's a, a couple of linked questions here, and I, I feel like we've we've already touched on these or even answered them. Um, which is uh, what financial support is there going forward for my staff? And if I take on new staff, can I furlough them at a later date? So um, as far as taking on new staff, and furloughing them at a later date, I don't know the answer to that one. So what, what would be the answer there if, if, if this all happens beyond today and we take new people on? It, it's the same rules that have always applied. So if they were not on the payroll um, before, oh gosh, the date has left my brain. It was it was only the 18th of February, and if you recall um, our earlier conversations, the government had a bit of backlash from that, so they actually moved it to the 19th of March, which was good because it allowed for some more people that were then on the payroll to be covered by furlough. But if it, it'll still apply, it's like what John said before around the self-employed um, perspective. If they've not been on the payroll from that date, they will not be able to to claim furlough and it, there's been particularly in my um my governing body the cipd there's you know there's been uproar in that regard because there have been so many people that fell between the two so you know we're sort of brought into a business new, new recruit 
furloughed by their new business. No, sorry, I, I, actually they can't, they can't be furloughed by them, but there isn't any work for them. And then their previous employer, because the government said that you could add them, you know, you could backdate it and, and add them to the furlough, it, it was down to the employer whether they wanted to. And a lot of employers, you know, ex-employers didn't want to, you know, whether there was sort of bad because they'd left the business or whatever. So these people, you know, had no choice but to go on to universal credit. Wow, okay. Um, the, the, the last question I think we've got here on that before we end the, the further conversation is, um, I, I've heard as well, I was interested in this, about there's some changes going on um, in terms of contributions and what businesses are ex expected to spend on this in the next few months, um, a greater shouldering from them. Um, so the question is, what are the changes going to be and when will the scheme end? Shall I pick that one up, Vic? Yeah, go for it. Might <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my myself. So, so basically, yes, um, employers will be expected to contribute going forward. So at the moment, in June, the the scheme as it is to an extent ends on the thirtieth of June, and from the first of July, um, there will be an opportunity to part time furlough. During July, though, the contribution from the government will remain the same, as in it will be 80% of an employee's wages while furloughed, with a cap of £2,500 per employee. Um, during July, the government will continue to pay the employer's national insurance and the employer's statutory pension contributions for the furloughed staff. From the 1st of August, the government will continue to pay the 80%, but employers will have to pay those national insurance contributions and pension contributions. From the 1st of September, the government will reduce its contribution to 70%. So um, an employer will have to pay basically 10% plus employers NI and contributions. In October, the government will reduce it to 60%, either therefore the employer pays 20%, plus employers NI and employers pension contributions. So basically from, from, from the 1st of August, the government's kind of scaling back its contribution a little bit each month. Um, and then in October, it gets down to that kind of the, the, the minimum contribution of the government's 0.60% in employers, employers NI and pension. And then on the 31st of October, the scheme ends. So it's just that kind of stepping it up and I guess what, what that will do, and I mean, just where Victoria will come in in terms of the practicalities, it will start to lead business owners to, to have to make a decision really over is there a job at the end of this for the staff? Because I guess it's one thing at the moment, it's probably been relatively easy to say, well, actually, rather than make that hard decision, I'll, I'll furlough the staff because it's not costing me a penny as, as the cost starts to come back onto an employer, even if it's only 20%. If you are, for example, particularly like in hospitality, travel, um, and what have you, who either will be operating at, at you know a part capacity because of social distancing or travel's not really happening, even twenty percent might be too much if you've got nothing coming in. So it'll start to, 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 to you know, people actually have to look at the future and what, what's happening there. That, that's interesting, John, because I know you and I had said quite early on, hadn't we, our prediction was that this would be maybe sector specific. So I was quite yeah. surprised when this came out that there's been nothing considered for hospitality. Yeah, yeah, so me too. The last to go back, aren't they? And as, as you say, you know, I, I'm talking to clients in that sector now who are saying, I cannot afford, can't mm -hmm. afford, those, you know, even if they open in July, but they've got these social distancing yeah. rules. They're not going to be at the full capacity they once were, so there will be, you know, that again, it, my governing body predictions are significant redundancies from sort of yeah, July yeah. onwards. Yeah, yeah I think, yeah, because also we, 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 we see the figures, and if you've only got half the tables open or one of the, or you know, travel as well, which is just going to take longer to get going it, again, because I mean, some people will travel, but some people won't want to because of the risks. Some will think, well, actually, how much fun do I have when I get there if I've got a, a motor for when I'm allowed to go to the pool or something? And and and, and yes, I, I I thought there might be something for those industries going, but yeah, mm -hmm. we can't afford to keep the staff on even at 20%. Yeah. 
So we're, uh, we've probably got time for another couple of questions. So I'll feel one and then um, we'll have one more. So a couple of questions that I've had uh, the last couple of uh, days have been um, similar kind of thing, which is really about sort of uh, pensions again, or savings and investments or however you want to look at it, it can be looked at differently. Same outcome though. So um, I'm due to retire this year. Should I be postponing my retirement? What should I do with my funds? Uh, and then also somebody else asked financially, I've got no idea if I'm saving enough each month, quite a, uh, a common uh, thing that, and how do I go about figuring this out? Is there a formula? So really simply, no, there is no formula uh, as such, because it really depends on what your plans are, which is why the, why the two are, are completely linked. So what, what I find that when, when I first, or when we first start speaking to uh, clients or potential clients is, um, there's three P's to uh, a good financial practice. There is the products, there is the process, and there is the plan. But what we find is that a lot of people live in the, um, in the sphere of product. So they get their product statements, they might check their funds, they watch the values go up and down. But ultimately, you kind of make all your decisions at that level. Now, what I would say is that when we start working with people, we put a process in place of ongoing regular reviews and analysis and, and data management. But then we ultimately find out what someone's plan is. Now, if you've got the three P's and you've got, you've got all of them sort of robust and you've figured out what your plan is and how long you'd like to work for and what you'd like your retirement to look for, these are all conversations that you should be having now. Regardless of what's going on in that product level, your product really should be just inherently linked to the others. So once you've got the water all flowing the right way and everything pulling in the right direction, it can be a really powerful force for good. Um, unfortunately, like I say, what happens is sometimes we're making decisions at a product level, which might not be aligned to our plan and actually can end up hurting our plan. So to those couple of people, we've got some uh, really good software. There's some really good software out there, actually, that professionals use to model this type of thing. And I'll just say have conversations with people, get, get a few names, have conversations with people about modeling what you want in the future to look like pretty simple um, once you've done that. Um, the, the last question, what I'll do is I'll focus on some positives before we end. So oh, that'd be quite nice. Um, which is all about return to work. So a um, couple of things here. So I think we might have touched on this at a session before, but how do we regulate holiday requests so that everyone is not off at the same time? And what is the position if staff go abroad and required to self quarantine for 14 days? So that's more around that kind of return to work piece. Um, and also Somebody's got a staff member who's just gone on, the, on sick and due to return to work in the next couple of weeks, what procedures do they need to follow? Is, is it the same, essentially, or has, has that changed massively because of this? Okay. Um, in relation to the leave, then um, what we've sort of been advising people to do is to encourage, really, their staff to take some leave during this period of time. So we, we got clarity on that not so long ago around furlough. So if you're member staff is furloughed they can still take leave so they don't have to you don't have to wait until the end of the furloughed leave for them them to take a load of accrued annual leave as well the only thing to bear in mind is if they are furloughed and they take annual leave if you're paying them at the 80 percent you need to top that up to 100 for those for those days so arguably say if you take two days you'd have to top up for that that period of time for any leave that you ask them to take, you have to give them double the notice. So if you ask them to take one day's leave, you'd have to give them two days notice that they are, are to take that leave. Then from a, um, and again, we did this in, in my business, we had a look at sort of people had accrued quite a bit of leave because they would have taken holidays, you know, so lots of people had, bless them, sort of cancelled holidays and plans. And, you know, our office manager had a, a 30th plan that, and a fantastic trip that didn't happen so they cancelled all that leave but we were fearful that by the time we came out of this we would have a lot of leave left and given the nature of, of our business we really couldn't afford to have everyone off at the same time because we need to deliver that that helpline that support so we would just spoke to spoke to the teams you know and, and asked them if they would take some leave during the lockdown period which was interesting really so they just take like one one day here one day there but um it was it was welcomed as well i think from people because they've been working at home for so long and you know given some of the challenges that they may have from a childcare perspective trying to juggle the two um it, it actually was very well received so i would urge people to have a look at sort of any leave that that is left and, and make sure that they, they deal with with that 
the quarantine um, situation is an interesting one, Alex, and it's probably something that I'll be able to, to talk more about over the next couple of weeks when we've got a bit more detail. I know obviously um, there is that uh, introduction that there'll be a 14 day quarantine um, and we have had people ask the question and arguably then what you've got to consider is the two week holiday plus the two week quarantine when they return. That could change, you know, and that's what we've been saying to clients at the moment, particularly with this sort of test and trace that may change because there has been an uproar about the introduction of that so late on. So I'll probably maybe hold that one and, and talk to you a bit later on about that, Alex, when I've got a bit more clarity. Um, and then your final question, sorry, Alex, what was that about absence? Yeah, so uh, I've lost it now. I've got to off it. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Um, so the question was, here we go, um, holiday request. Uh, I've got a staff member who's gone on sick and we're due to return to work in the next couple of weeks. What procedures do I need to follow? Is it, I assume it's the same as what it has always been, isn't it? The same, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's difficult to answer without further detail. And if somebody's on the call now, more than welcome for them to reach out to me now and I'll give them some guidance off the call. Um, if it's COVID related, then yeah, you know, we, we have had to update some of our policies in that regard. So it may be slightly different, but if not, it's just it, as it would always be, you know, you need to adhere to your absence policy. You need to be um, consistent in your approach and the way in which you treat this person it needs to be the way in which you would treat, treat anyone else within the business. But yeah, happy to talk to that individual um, separately offline. Okay. Well, that kind of brings us nicely to half past four. Now we've got a couple of questions which are waiting um, and I appreciate we've kind of, we're running over if we go into those now. So what I'll do is I'll send an email to everybody that's attended. Thank you very much for your time. And, and we'll try and cover those off and get the panel's feedback for you beyond this. Um, we'll also send out um, a recording of this this time. So last time, my apologies, I, uh, I messed up the recording last time. Technology is not my friend uh, all the time. And so we'll get the recording out to you. We'll also create um, a few links on social media, so feel free to follow us on the uh, Liverpool Entrepreneurs Club. You can find that on LinkedIn. Um, and we'll also send sort of a, the next dates for the next session um, as things are still rapidly evolving as we go along. But that's it for, for today, everybody. Thank you very much for attending and um, look forward to seeing you all soon at some point, maybe face-to-face, -face, who knows? So thanks very much.